<coughs> know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. You may be seated. Last week, we began our conversation on these three verses. If you're keeping track, you know it's the same three. And we didn't make it past the statement, quick to hear. Um, what we discussed, there's a lot of distractions in the world. We live in an overstimulated culture. It's very difficult to just set and actively and intentionally listen to the word. On top of that, our own inherent sinful nature will naturally drift away from Scripture unless we intentionally submit ourselves back to uh, the Lord on a continual basis. The Word of God is provided as a means to awaken, to provoke, to stimulate the new man that is inside of us uh, Christ, that Christ Jesus gave to us when He saved us. The Word is a lamp unto our feet. It lights our path. It is the living water for a parched soul. Quick to hear means that we should run to every opportunity to receive, to read, to study, and to consume the Word of God. It is essential to the spiritual life of a believer. But while we are commanded to run to opportunities to hear the gospel, we are immediately reminded that it is also imperative and important that we be slow to speak. If you remember from last week, we discussed it's important to quick to hear, but it's also important to be slow to speak when it comes to interpersonal relationships. If you're married, you understand this very well. You understand that it's very important, that communication is one of the most important parts of a relationship. It's very important to every interpersonal relationship, and it's always, part, it's always important to be quick to listen to the other person and be slow to speak and, and be that type. But that's not what James is talking about in context, though that is wise. <coughs> he is specifically talking about our interactions with the Word of God. Be quick to hear the Word of God and be slow to speak regarding the Word of God. Now, what is this telling us specifically? In contrast to our previous statement, while we should be especially obedient and intentional of the thought of hearing the Word of God, we should also be cautious, patient, and careful if we have an opportunity to speak, teach, preach, or even explain the Scriptures to someone else. What it appears like as a whole is, is that James had an issue, so, a similar to we have in 2023. Back then, he had an issue with some people that were sort of talking before they listened. Uh, and, and James points out to us in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. When an individual speaks by teaching the word of God, they are officially agreeing to put themselves categorically into a new level of stricter judgment. Now, this shouldn't make someone that is called to preach, uh, it, it shouldn't make them so fearful that they refute that calling, but it should cause them to walk out the responsibility in their life with the utmost respect and fear of God, knowing they're held to a higher standard. Being slow to speak is difficult. We've all been called to proclaim the gospel. We've all been called to speak and explain the scriptures. Maybe not teach from a position of an elder over the body, but we've been all called to proclaim the scriptures. So it's important that when we do speak, we're slow and we're careful that we make sure that we have first actively studied, listened, and understood the word. But being slow to speak is difficult. We live in a world of narcissism. This culture trains us to be narcissists 
uh, without us even realizing it most of the time. (coughs) Really, narcissism is just a clinical term to describe a spiritual condition, which is the idolization of self. Uh, For one own person to make them own selves their own God. The temptation for someone to make themselves their own God reaches all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It was the very thing that Satan tempted Eve with, to be like God. Satan insinuated that by God holding back the knowledge of good and evil, that he was somehow uh, being corrupt in doing so. So he provokes Eve's desire to want to be her own God. And she takes that status into her own hands when she partakes of the fruit. And so her and Adam fell into the same temptation that you and I collide with every day. And that's to be like God. This world has a lot of things that they like to to say and to tell us. Live your truth. Decide what is good for you. Do what makes you happy. Cut people off that don't make you happy. Quit that job that doesn't make you happy. All that matters is that you feel good about yourself. Your happiness is all that matters. You are the source of your own truth. You're enough for yourself. You're perfect the way that you are. Now, these statements on the surface seem like a really nice thing to say. They seem like a healthy way for someone to feel like they're loved, like they're special, they're good enough, they're moral, they're clean. But they're a lie. All of them. What this is doing is this (coughs) is ascribing God-like characteristics to fallible, imperfect human beings. Let's see what this has gotten us. Two, three decades of this sort of positive self-talk where we have walked around saying, oh, you're good enough, you're amazing, your happiness is all that matters. What has two or three decades of doing this? Well, we have the highest suicide rate ever. We have the highest rate of mass shootings in the history of the world, the highest rate of depression, the highest rate of mental illness, the highest rate of high school dropouts, the highest rate of crime amongst young people, the highest rate of teenage pregnancies, the highest rate of abortions, the highest rate of gender confusion, the highest rate of body dysphoria, which is this condition where people will hyper-obsess about what they perceive to be bodily imperfections about themselves the highest rate of drug use, the highest divorce rate ever, and it's never been easier to get a divorce, the highest rate of sexual deviancy amongst minors, the highest uh, uh, quantity of pornography material available, the highest percentage of couples living together before marriage, uh, uh, lowest percentage of available healthcare professionals due to overwhelming demand. Man, this whole last couple decades of positive self-talk where we walk around and tell people they're good enough, that's really worked out well for us, hasn't it? What it's actually doing is destroying us because it's setting a standard that is based off of a lie that we cannot reach. This positive self-talk stuff actually is setting us up for failure. And what it does is at the end of the day, it leaves a person feeling more hopeless than they were before because it points the answer to their problems back to the person that has the problems. An empty person cannot find the answer to their emptiness in their own self, which is already empty. That is essentially, quantifiably, the the example of the blind leading the blind. An empty person, you and me, needs the hope of the gospel. Something outside of ourselves. 
We are not our own answer. And positive self-talk, though it makes people, it's got a little dopamine hit and a little raise in serotonin, makes us feel better in the moment. At the end of the day, when you lay your head on your pillow, it's not true. This has led to all sorts of issues in culture. Delayed adolescence. People not growing up. We're coddling their insecurities rather than calling them out of it. It used to be the boys were considered men at a young age of 12 and 13. Now we have boys with beards living under their mama's care, still cutting the crust of their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, spending their days playing video games, eating and watching porn. Women used to have a fine selection of men, godly men that were responsible, knew how to treat women, were strong, good providers and protectors. Now they can't find a lot of them. It's a rare breed. But it's not all the guy's fault. Women don't want to submit to a husband either. They've been indoctrinated by culture that woman power means you can't be held down by any man and you can do whatever you want. No, woman was not designed to do whatever she wanted and neither were men designed to do whatever they wanted. Men were designed to do what men were supposed to do by God and men were des- women were designed to do what women were supposed to do by God. Men were specifically designed to lead and serve. They were designed to protect and provide, to sacrificially put themselves on the front line. Women were designed to nurture a home, to be the primary influencer in a child's life. She is uniquely designed to cultivate an atmosphere that makes people feel safe and cared for and loved. Men cannot do this. So now we have men that don't want to lead and women that that don't want to be led and children that are just lost in the confusion because everyone is just too narcissistic and prideful to admit that God's way is actually far better than the way we want to do things. We live in a culture that says, you do you. And anyone that challenges that doesn't deserve to be in your life. Cancel them. Unfriend them. Get rid of them. Just write off these people. They're toxic. And even worse, for Christianity, we live in a church culture that supports it. We design worship services around the person. What do you want? What do you want in a youth group? What do you want in a kids ministry? What do you want in a worship service? Let's design it in the time frame that you want. Let's, let's do the songs that you want. Let's preach the sermon in the time frame that you want. Let's design the entire thing around your preferences. And then we're going to give you about, I, I don't know, 250 different options that you can bounce from one to another when one doesn't really uh, uh, meet your self-centeredness the way that you want. So the church culture now feeds this narcissistic behavior instead of calling people out of it. This is why slow to speak is so difficult. (laughs) Many of us were so consumed with our own thoughts about ourselves and our lives and our agendas, we can't be quick to hear. We don't hear anything except for the small bite-sized internet consumables that most of them that we're drawn to affirm our desires to love ourselves. We speak before being taught. We assume what the scriptures mean before we truly hear them and let them offend us so they can transform us. We read the stories and the narratives of Jesus and we see ourselves in him rather than seeing Jesus and allowing that to confront our sinfulness. We read the scriptures and we read ourselves into the scriptures. Oh, I'm David and my big bad boss that's been mean to me is Goliath and I'm just gonna take him out whenever I don't show up for work when he really needs me. No, David is a shadow and type of Christ. Goliath is sin and death. We were the scared Israelites sitting on the side that did nothing about the problem and could do nothing about the problem. So we read ourselves into the Bible. We read ourselves into it rather than letting the Bible investigate us and challenge us and pull out our sensibilities. We open our mouths to share our perspectives, our takes, our opinions before we truly have actively and intentionally allowed the word of God to permeate and destroy our egos and kill that ever so powerful allure to love ourselves. If all of these things are true, 
<coughs> live your truth, decide what is good for you, do what makes you happy. If all of these things are true, why do we have no peace? Why are we empty? Why are we depressed? Why are we anxious? And why do we have no joy? Because if all these things were really true, if these things were really true, if I, I just live my life happy, if, if, if I'm enough for myself, if I'm perfect the way I am, if all of these things are true, I would have none of those problems because we would be self-sufficient gods. But we aren't. We are humans. We are finite. We are fallible. We are fallen. And we need life on the outside of us to redeem us. That's the truth. One big reason why we have fallen into the trap of believing this garbage is because we are too busy wanting people to understand us. I just want to be understood. I want to tell my story. I want to tell my trauma. I want to this, that. We want people to understand us in our experience. We did more talking than listening. Young people listen to my heart. Sometimes I know they, they look boring and they sound boring, but as old people, sometimes we've kind of went through things. And I know that you don't think we understand what you go through, but we do. And so sometimes it's important to, 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 to take that in. But old people alike, sometimes we're, we're a little prideful and, and we think we got everything figured out. And there's an importance that sometimes there's things that young people can teach us. When a person that does more talking than listening, their words are empty and lifeless because there may be a lot of them, but there's not a lot of quanti- there's not a lot of substance. A Christian who shares the scriptures without sound doctrinal understanding is just sharing their opinions and their ideas, and that is very, very dangerous. Here is the thing about these lies: God is all of these things for us. We don't have to live our own truth because God is truth. We don't have to decide what is good for you because God is good. We don't have to do what makes us happy because God makes us content. It's not a fleeting emotion that comes and goes. It's an inner spiritual contentment that lasts for a lifetime. It's sustainable over time. We don't have to cut people off that don't make you happy because we can love people through God. He enables us to even love our enemies. We don't have to quit that job just because it doesn't make me happy because we can follow God's plan for our life. And maybe he has you at that job that you hate and it's just because we're disgruntled and discontent. But maybe there's a coworker sitting right next to you that needs to know the gospel. All that matters is you feel good about yourself. Well, God gives you a new identity in Christ. It's something outside of yourself. It's something bigger than yourself. You get to be a part of something that's way bigger than you. Uh, uh, and that is a good thing. Your happiness is all that matters. No, Jesus' grace and mercy shown to you is all that matters. You are the source of your own truth. No, God is truth. You're enough for yourself. No, Jesus is enough for you. You're perfect the way you are. No, you're not. Jesus is perfect, so you don't have to be. And this should come as a relief because you can set back and relax God does all the heavy lifting. All you have to do is trust him and follow him. You don't have to be all these things to yourself or to anyone else because God does it and he's perfect at it. And the reason why we're anxious and depressed is we try to be like God and we can't because we're not made that way. We're not divine. He is. So just chill. Chill. And trust and follow. That's all you got to do. You ain't got to be these things to yourself or anybody else. Who are the most listened to people in the Bible today? Oftentimes it's celebrities. Most of them recent converts. Kanye West or Yee or whatever he calls himself. Podcasters, influencers that oftentimes say they're Christians have no idea what they're talking about. They're not elders. They're not called to to preach the word, but they get listened to. I was listening the other day to a podcast, Logan Paul. He's a YouTube influencer. I think he does MMA fighting, some WWE stuff. And uh, I had caught his podcast. I was listening to it. 
and he was talking to his friend that's a professed Christian. And Logan Paul was asking him questions about Christianity and, and, and sort of like navigating the faith. Logan Paul is an active non-believer. He's rejected Christ. He don't, doesn't accept Christianity for himself. And so as he was asking these questions, he understood Christianity better than his friend who is a professed Christian did. He was saying, well, aren't, if you're a Christian, you have to denounce this sin and you have to live this certain way and you can't accept these things in culture. And his friend was like, well, you know, there's different people that have different opinions and, you know, it, it, it's really where our job is to love everybody and, and I don't know a whole lot about the, these sins and sort of thing and everybody kind of has their own path. And I'm like, dude, the guy that is actively rejecting Christianity knows more about what Christianity is about than the guy who professes to have it. Ask a believer to make a defense for their faith. There's a lot of times they're left speechless, sometimes spending years identifying as a Christian, going to church, but they cannot make a case for their own faith. They cannot even explain the gospel in the simplest of terms. They'll say, well, you need a preacher for that. Preachers aren't going to save anybody on judgment day. You're not going to stand before God and you know, I'm uh, Pastor Josh is going to come up and stand before me. He's got a few things he wants to say. Uh, here, here's the deal, God. I know Bob. I know Bob doesn't know you. I know he doesn't even know the simplistic terms of the gospel, but he showed up every week. He took the offering. He was a nice guy. He even wore a tie. You know, he, he cleaned the bathrooms every now and again, so I think you should let him in based on those merits. It doesn't work like that. Pastors are not mediators. At the end of the day, the, you don't need a preacher to explain the gospel. Preachers aren't going to save anyone on judgment day. You need to know it yourself. How can you believe in something that you don't know? I recently was listening to a sermon. I heard the pastor say, I'm not very good with this theology and this Bible stuff. And then he went on to talk for 35 minutes about the Bible. I mean, what profession do we allow people to get away with that? Well, welcome to the brake pad conference. I know absolutely nothing about brake pads, but I'm gonna stand up here for 35 minutes and tell you about brake pads. Walk out, right? So we, get, we, we sit in rooms where pastors say, I'm not really a, a, a Bible expert, but let me talk for the next 35 and share a bunch of stories and then tell you that Jesus loves everyone. And, and we're satisfied with that? What, what industry gets away with that? This is the mentality I grew up. It started in the 90s. A church needs a cool youth pastor. So we elevate the 20-year-old young man who has no clue what they're doing. They couldn't exegete a blank piece of paper, more or less a Bible verse, all because he wears a hat backwards, has a fish tattoo, knows how to put on pizza parties and run lock-ins. We rush our kids into these groups with no idea what they're actually being taught. They come out with stickers and prizes full of pizza and gas. They had a lot of fun and it was cool. All the while, they have no clue what's being taught. Our kids enjoy it. That's all that matters. They run off to college and Surprise, when they started dealing with their faith on their own, they apostatized. They ran away from the gospel. Quick to hear, slow to speak. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions. That doesn't mean you can't share your testimony. That doesn't mean you can't walk through a study and talk about the Bible with someone. It means before you go talking on behalf of God in his words, explaining in a, in a teacher-pupil situation, you must have spent time intently listening to it first, lest you be tempted to lure yourself and others away with a narcissistic false theology that will damn the soul. A Stoic philosopher, <coughs> Zeno, he said, we have two ears and one mouth, therefore we should listen twice as much as we speak. The rabbis put it even better. Men have two ears, but one tongue that they should hear more than they speak. The ears are always open, ever re to receive instruction, but the tongue is surrounded with a double row of teeth to hedge it in and keep it within proper bounds. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Your tongue is, is, is held captive. Proverbs ten nineteen. when words are many, in other words, when this is happening, transaction, <laughs> transgression is not lacking. Some, some translations say sin is close behind, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Our natural tendency 
is to jump to wrong conclusions and call it discernment. To offer advice and call it wisdom. To share what's on my heart, even though it's just an opinion that's an error. A person that is wise stops and says, before I teach, I need to consider the category of judgment that I'm putting myself into. And I should probably do this with the utmost fear and reverence of the Lord, of whom I will stand before someday and give an account. That doesn't mean you don't do it if you're called. It means you feel the weight and the gravity of it all. Slow to anger. The word for anger here is orhihe. This is not a, an explosive outburst of anger when Patrick Mahomes throws an interception. It is an inner deep resentment that builds, a bitterness that stirs. Again, the context is regarding the word of God. Be slow to build resentment against the word. In other words, the, the context there is don't. When it confronts sin or challenges your feelings. Now, oftentimes what happens, people will present this, um, this inner orhihe in a lot of different ways. Sometimes people will be actively verbal. Read Romans 1, don't like it. That's actually the healthiest. Okay, let's talk about it. And as long as at the end of the day you're willing to submit to the scriptures, we're good. But, but it's okay to find something that bothers you and you're offended by it. Let's push into it and let's discuss it. Let's talk to it. That's the healthiest way when people verbally express their feelings outwardly. Sometimes they'll find a way to excuse away clear teachings. Well, you know, Paul said that. Jesus didn't say it. I'm a red letter guy. And so I'm going to, you know, well, that was just a cultural thing. It doesn't apply today. That, that sort of conversation. And then there's, there's people who will um, just happen over the tough spots like they don't exist. Have, have any of you ever had the silent treatment played on you? Okay, now here's a tougher question. How many of you have played the silent treatment game? All right, there we go. All right, we got some honest people in the room. All right, so, so, so the silent treatment, it's, it's one of the most brutal ways to communicate. It's, it's passive aggressive, right? It's one of the most brutal ways to communicate your frustration, and it's unnerving, and it's, and it's unfair. If we'll be honest, it's unfair to passively communicate your anger. And so what happens is when sometimes people have an inner anger and resentment towards the word, they'll just skip over and almost give the silent treatment to parts of the Bible that offend them. Pretend like it's not there. And, and we have, we're full of churches that will enable people to do that. Well, we're not going to talk about that verse because it's going to offend people and it's going to cause a bunch, you know, people will leave and, and have their feelings hurt. And so we aid that sort of mentality. Well, I don't like that part of the Bible, so I'm just going to skip over it, sort of give it the silent treatment. And you know, you always will know these people because they will live in the open with their sin, unrepentant, as if the Bible doesn't even talk about it. It's almost like sometimes they wave it in front of you. I dare you to confront me because I'll call you a judgmental person and express my anger towards you about this whole rule thing. That's just rebellion. That's not. Remember the narcissism we talked about, which, which type of person in the world is the most difficult to confront? A narcissist. Because there's always a, a thick layer of self-love that prevents them from seeing themselves as the issue. So the only way to, to successfully confront a narcissist is to be very direct and corner them logically in an inescapable way. And when that happens, what happens from a narcissist? Anger. Outburst. There could develop a hostile disposition to truth when it doesn't correspond with our convictions. And people will sometimes express when they're cornered and when they're confronted and they're actually challenged. And people will respond in a lot of different ways. Sometimes they just get mad at the preacher. I love you guys. Sometimes you guys will just straight up tell me, I don't like you right now. <laughs> I like, and I'll just smile because I'm like, I get it, I get it. Um, yeah, I, have this, I do this thing if you're around for any length of time. Um, yes, God. Uh, so... I, if you've been around for any length of time, you know that like at the end of service, 
uh, when I'm saying, like, hey, love you, church, see you next week, I am heading straight out that door. And sometimes I'm moving before I'm even done talking. You know why? I got to get to that door because I want to try to connect with as many people as I want. And some of y'all hit that door like the fire alarm's going off. (laughs) I don't know if it's because you're trying to beat the Baptist to the buffet. I don't know if it's because the game's on. I don't know if it's because you're an introvert like me and you're just done with people. I don't know what it is, but like you hit that door as fast as you can. So I'm trying to beat you to it is what I'm doing. I'll be honest with you. There are sometimes I would much rather go crawl in my office and get under my desk and wait till everybody leaves um, because I realize I just stood up here and ate everyone's lunch and I'm not a particular fan of being disliked. And I must confess, sometimes it's an awkward thing for me to smile and shake your hand knowing that I just basically told you you're a dirty, rotten sinner, okay? Because I do realize that sometimes the messenger gets shot. (laughs) But what we have to realize is that's part of the responsibility when you speak up. People aren't going to like it. It's going to challenge them. And if you want to speak, you have to understand that it's not so that people will like you. It's so that they will know the truth of the gospel. Galatians 4.16, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? It can be an issue in our predisposition to sin, to elevate our own self-will to a supreme position over truth. To a degree that we are willing to do this, And it is the degree to which our hostility has the potential to grow. Verse 20 goes on to say, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger can be righteous. It is an emotion that God has given us. It's very rarely um, righteous. There are rare occasions where it can be. Jesus flipping the tables in the temple would be an example of right. Any time that Jesus was angry, obviously, would be an example of righteous anger since he was completely and perfectly righteous. But there are times anger can be righteous. If someone preaches a false doctrine and lies to deceive others, there should be anger. Someone's killing babies, there should be righteous anger. If someone preaches the truth and it just hurts the ego, the anger is simply a human anger and Nothing godly can come from it. This anger is not a pure emotion. It's usually contaminated with sin, self-importance, self-assertion, intolerance, stubbornness. And despite what we tell our spouses, our stubbornness is not a virtue. One commentator put it like this, The great talker is rarely a great listener, and never is the ear more firmly closed than when anger takes over. The text then goes on to give us a command of what to do to be successful at these things. How, do we, how are we successful at quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? How can we do this successfully? Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. Put away sin and receive the word with humility. This is a pattern that is repeated in the word frequently, Ephesians 4.22, to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and the true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3.8, but now you must put them all the way, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it uh, you may grow up in <coughs> to salvation. The context for the word filthiness is a deliberate and determined impurity. It is ongoing sin or rebellion. You will never be able to hear if you don't lay aside your rebellion. The idea of receiving the word with meekness or humility is the idea of laying your ego aside. 
It's being a teachable person, a moldable person, like a piece of clay in the potter's hands. A faithful Christian receives the word with a submissive, gentle, and teachable spirit. When this occurs, what you're doing, when you lay your ego aside and you you, uh, receive with humility, you are cultivating the soil of your heart, getting rid of the weeds, getting rid of the rocks, getting rid of the rough stuff that inhibits the growth of the plant, and you're allowing the seed to take root, God then and they let it to be watered by the word, and then God makes it grow and eventually bears fruit. 1 Peter 1.23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and the abiding word of God. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Matthew 13.23, as for what was sown on good soil, This is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another 60 and another 30. And then it goes on in verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with me as the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. There is nothing else that will save your soul. The word of God produces faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So word of God produces faith because faith comes by hearing and you are saved by faith through grace. The word of God is the entry point for a person to establish a genuine, real Faith in God. We must be quick to hear. Run to every opportunity to learn, to study, to know, to understand, to to allow it to confront you. Slow to speak. That before I open my mouth and I begin to declare things that I think I know, I first have been diligently studied. I have submitted myself to the scriptures. I'm not in rebellion. I have confirmed that I have not made up a bunch of imaginatory things about the text, but instead I have, re- I have had it revealed to me in its original context by the Holy Spirit and that, that it's confirmed and then slow to anger that I do not allow it to provoke me to an inner deep resentment to the point to where I give the Bible a silent or parts of the Bible a silent treatment, but instead I receive it and say, you know what? God's way is higher than my way. His truth is the real truth. It's not my truth. It's his truth. And my truth needs to come into alignment with his truth because my truth sometimes can deceive me and can end up being a lie. And at the end of the day, this is the only thing that can save your souls. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You are saved by faith through grace alone. Let's pray.